Song of the South needs no formal introduction. It's well known for being a Disney property that's been purposely hidden away, rendered unavailable for the general public to see. More people probably know about its problematic hindrance, versus those that have probably seen the movie, being since the 90s where this film was classed to be unethical to show within the US. The subject of banning media that's not politically correct in our modern age is still a subject that remains relevant. At the time of this video being in production, it's currently the mist of 2020, where within the light of the upheaval protests over George Floyd's death, causing the debate of racial inequality, and relating back to the video, is that how do we perceive media that was made in another time? As many films and shows with dated depictions of minority groups have either had an attachment of a warning of the offending content, or completely removed altogether in light of the situation. <laughs> we shall discuss further the 2020 debacle and how exactly Song of the Self came back in the recent discussion. But first I feel it's important to understand as to where exactly Song of the Self came from. But first, before we begin, allow me to clarify that I'm not here to make you appreciate or dislike the topic, or use this video to win a debate. For example, if you hate Walt Disney, believing that he's an absolute evil tyrant, then you're probably not going to appreciate what I'm going to say about him. Or if you're somebody on the opposite end, absolutely adoring Walt Disney, believing that he can do no wrong, then you probably won't appreciate the direction this video will go in. At the end of the day, me and this video are just merely a connoisseur to open a window to another time. We can't change the past, we can only go forward and learn from it. I can only hope to offer a new perspective. The tales of Br'er Rabbit and Uncle Remus originated from the book stories by Joe Chandler Harris. Born in 1848 as an illegitimate child, with his father shortly abandoning him and his mother, the naive young lad had an uphill battle, surrounded by his peers in private school, as he had a tendency to stutter and stammer that would have made him an easy target. Although he was a bright pupil doing immensely well at reading and writing, but flourished poorly as a student, eventually leading him to drop out. But just around the corner, the American Civil War had commenced, making it difficult for the young man to find any work. That was until, at the age of 14, Joseph Anderson Turner hired him on board to help him write The Countryman, which was the only newspaper in the country to centre around plantations. The boy came to live on Turner's plantation. During his time there, he befriended some of Turner's slaves, such as Uncle George Terrell and Auntie Chrissy where they would tell the boy about their traditions and stories, sharing old folk tales and oral stories such as Br'er Rabbit, with the titular character usually learning a moral, which the tales had originated from Africa, passed down by generations, but with each retelling had been slightly modified to fit in with the American location. Joe Chandler Harris felt that he could relate and connect with the formal slaves, as they had been heavily judged throughout their lives, just like himself despite the fact that he had a much more privileged lifestyle compared to the slaves. In his adulthood, he would write down these stories that he heard on the plantation. In the context of the book, they were a collection of tales that were told by Uncle Remus, an old, humble man that was a formal slave. Chandler Harris' retellings of these old tales were the American equivalent of A. A. Mills' Winnie the Pooh in popularity. He also wrote for race relations and support of the African Americans, which made him a progressive man for his time. His works would leave an impact for the reformation of the literacy field. He would pass away in 1908. Although criticism has a rise of his work and legacy, such as his stories appropriating African-American folk tales, and the country dialect that Chandler used for the black people in his stories. While historical records have pointed towards this perhaps being a real dialect of its time, with the upper class systems of those days, people that didn't speak well-rounded like the royal family were perceived of not being very clever, with the tales of Uncle Remus being one of the very few characters within pop culture at that point to represent African American culture. The Chandler stories being wide and popular would create an idyllic image of black people being happy and subservient within a hermit state. 
as those sort of people and others that didn't look of European descent were not seen or classed as real people within a white society, and the imagery and tropes that originated from the Uncle Remus stories would only help to reinforce this idea. Even if Chandler had innocent intents, preserving this piece of American folktale, but through an immature and racist culture, the stories were used in a mean of separation to justify that two groups of people were widely different from one another. This doesn't mean a superiority, but it does imply a verse and states that we are different and we're always going to be different. Now, I don't want to marry into your family. I'm sure I you don't want to marry you. into mine. I didn't ask you. you. I've got my, I'm married. Well, you, you select the wife of your choice and I select the wife of my choice. If, if, if my son and your daughter saw each other and they liked each other, let them mind their own business. Next to it, on that note, I'll see you in the movies. 38 years later, after Chandler's death, his stories would reach on a new level of the public's interest in the form of Hollywood's most controversial movie to date. The 1940s was a depressing time for the Disney company, as the following feature films grew ever more expensive, but they didn't turn back much for a profit. There was also a hierarchy developing at the studio, where those that were the main screenwriters and head animators would be paid in royalty where those that were lower down in the working force would be placed in atrocious conditions to work in and would receive very little salary. Walt Disney, in his mind, saw no initial problem. Spending years of blood, sweat and tears into his own studio, he felt that he could run it as he wished. The company was his family and he was the family man. But the breaking point came at Dumbo, where after the failing nature of his previous feature films, he was trying to cut costs and laying off a few of his workers. A whole lot of his animators went on strike. This went on for five weeks until finally Walt Disney signed the union agreement, allowing equal pay and working conditions for all the staff and crew. This experience traumatized Disney, not wanting to bring in outside influences. Dumbo would be marked as the final feature film that Walt had that family feel towards, and things would be in disrepair once his next feature film Bambi would have a lukewarm reception at the box office. Disney couldn't afford to have any more box office flops if he wanted his company to stay afloat. Walt's other feature film projects had to be placed on hold, as he had to think of his next upcoming feature film that wouldn't play as a financial risk to produce. A nostalgic story that he turned towards for inspiration was the old Uncle Remus stories, a relationship he maintained with the books since his young childhood, and for years desperately wanted to create his own film adaptation Disney was able to acquire the film rights with the Harris family back in 39. Walt felt for the most practical and cost-effective way to bring these stories to life was to have the human characters such as Uncle Remus in live action, and the tales of Br'er Rabbit would be illustrated through animation, combining both the live action and animation together, feeling confident that it could successfully be done. By judging the technology of their most recent anthology film at the time, The Three Caballeros, which combined both mediums together. By having the film with real actors and only having a third of it being animated, it would heavily reduce the cost of making it. Which at the time, his bankers weren't so confident for Walt to make another feature film within the medium of animation, since those films came with such a hefty price tag. Thus, the Uncle Remus story was going to be the first live-action narrative movie from the Disney company. But it was also going to be one of the first major Hollywood movies to heavily star an African-American cast, and even having a main character that was African-American. So when the film was first announced, there was a huge contentment towards how the plantation workers were going to be betrayed as folks that weren't white in that era of film were usually not betrayed in the most friendliest of ways, and even those that were seen as the exception of the rule were still only side and secondary characters. During the time that the film was in production, the topic of plantation and slavery was still very much in living memory. Walt Disney was pressing on an adaptation with social issues, so he brought on the left-wing and old-fashioned Donald Raymond to pen the screenplay which for Donald was the first time that he ever endeavoured in such a task. But upon early review of the Hayes Office, a platform that regulated the offensibility of America's feature films, founded in 1934 and ran up until 1968, they found in the script to be a lot of offensive dialogue towards African Americans, 
Walt Disney had to appeal to the production code. It was a non-negotiable matter. Walt Disney hired Clarence Muse as a consultant on the film. Clarence had initially started his career as a lawyer. Finding limited opportunities as a black man, he moved swiftly onwards to the entertainment field, becoming an actor, director, and writer. He was a commendable man for black rights. Clarence felt that this was a great opportunity for Disney to really transcend the stories, to make the perceptions of the blacks more respectable and commendable. That's if, if he can shy away from the most egregious stereotypes. But as a man that never appreciated the criticism of his work, Walt Disney wanted to treat his childhood simple tales as that. And Donald Raymond ignored what the consultant had to say. And only after a short while, Clarence left the project. As the film prevailed, Clarence censored nothing on his true thoughts of the project, only heightening the film's persona before its release. Through the ongoing news stories, the NAACP and the American Council for Race Relations and more desperately wanted to get involved and see the draft script. But Walt Disney politely rejected the offers. I never test the film beyond the studio. No, we, we sort of uh, we, we sort of design the films to appeal to ourselves. Yeah. And uh, we're our own censors. Within the studio group, if we do something that isn't right, we hear from the, the various members of the staff, it just isn't right, you can't do that. So I test my films with my own people. But through these ongoing pressures from separate parties, Walt Disney hired another consultant, an experienced screenwriter, Maurice Rapf. With his background coming from a Jewish family, Walt felt that he was an eligible man for writing sensitive material. But Maurice was mortified over the lines of dialogue using the word master and blackies, and told Disney not to go through the movie. But Walt asked if he could perhaps rewrite the screenplay, allowing him to make drastic changes towards the story, and also alter the animated segments, as up to that stage they had only just been merely storyboarded, thus they could be drastically reshaped. He took on the offer, but he kept clashing with the original screenwriter Donald Raymond. Maurice would eventually resign from the project as well, with Donald restructuring his final draft, with the lines of dialogue clarifying that Uncle Remus and the other plantation workers were not slaves, would be eliminated in the final script. Walt Disney would go on record clarifying that the African Americans seen in the film were not slaves, as many audience members were confused if they were slaves or not. The film never clarifies as to the exact position that the plantation workers are in. This aspect is probably one of the greatest split ends from the whole movie, as does it take place before or post-Civil War, when slavery was abolished. This is an aspect that's heavily argued upon between critics and the general public to this day. This does take place in a time of slavery, and it's definitely addressed, sort of and a super idyllic look at a master-slave type relationship. They seem like pretty jolly slaves, and they're even holding a candle vigil for this kid. He runs away from home, and his family owns slaves. But it really looks like a plantation full of happy-go-lucky slaves who are more than pleased to do the bidding of their masters. Donald Raymond only took on board a fraction of the feedback for the final script, which earned his approval on the Hayes office allowing the film to go into pre-production with a middling budget of $2 million, then commencing in principal photography in 1944, being filmed in Hollywood in Samuel Goldwyn Studios. Directing duties were given to Har Foster, with the animation being supervised by Wolfer Jackson. The role of Uncle Remus the pinnacle of the heart and soul of the whole picture was played by James Baskett, initially starting his career to study pharmatology, but lacking the finance to study, James turned towards a career of acting in Hollywood. He had actually previously worked for Disney in the 1941 film Dumbo, doing a voice of one of the crows. <laughs> Many years later, when he was enrolling for Song of the South, he was intending just to do a bit part, voicing a butterfly. But when Walt Disney was listening to his voice, he wanted a chance to personally meet James Baskett one-on-one. -on -one. When the two men met up, Walt Disney convinced James Baskett to audition for the role of Uncle Remus. And not too long after that audition, he got the gig. 
He played not only Uncle Remus, but also the Butterfly and Brer Fox. Mr. Disney admired James Basket. According to his sister, he said, He is the best actor, I believe to be discovered in years, working wholly without direction. After production of the film had concluded, Walt Disney and James Basket kept in close contact, but during this time, James Basket's health was heavily decreasing. Disney sent gifts an ample amount of money to help him and his family get on by, but that wasn't enough. Disney wanted to ensure at the Oscars that his performance wouldn't be unnoticed, but for a loophole, at the time, the Academy wouldn't recognise an actor if they wouldn't get top billing, but he was probably not nominated for a much more unfair reason. James Basket's co-star, Hattie McDaniel, at the time was the only other African-American to actually win an Oscar. It was still extremely rare for anybody of colour to even be nominated. I wish somebody would help me right now, because I didn't expect, so I had a, nothing in my mind. But Disney was able to convince the Academy to give an honourable reward to James Basket during the 20th Academy historically making him the first African-American man to ever win that reward. Sadly though, for James, it would be a short-lived victory, as he would pass away only four months later. Jamie was played by named at the time Bobby Driscoll, who was the first actor to be under a personal contract with the Disney company, starring in many early Disney live-action features and he would eventually go off and be the voice of Disney's Peter Pan. By this time, he had renamed himself Robert Driscoll, as a way to distance himself from his younger image. By the 60s, he was struggling with a drug addiction. He relocated to New York to start a new life, but he would pass away in 1968. Ginny was played by Luana Patton, who started her career as a child model, with Song of the South being her first feature film. Reuniting with Bobby in another Disney flick called So Dear to My Heart, she would go on acting as an adult, but never reaching the same popularity from her days at Disney, and would eventually retire in 1986. She would pass away a decade later at the age of 57. The young African-American that befriends Johnny, Little Toby, was played by Glenn Leeby. He was discovered playing on the playground by a Disney talent scout, and out of the three main child actors, he was the oldest at the age of seven, and Dota was promoted the least when it came to the marketing of the movie. Him and his family relocated to Los Angeles, in the hopes for him to pursue a career into acting. Although, unlike his co-stars, he didn't appear in any other feature films. Glenn Leeby would be remarried several times and have many children, and would pass away at the age of 68. Real-life couples at the time, Ruth Warwick and Eric Rolfe, played Johnny's mother and father, but however they separated during the same year that the movie was released. Hattie McDaniel acted as Aunt Tempe, and as mentioned earlier, was the first African-American to win an Oscar in the 1939 epic Gone with the Wind. It too is usually compared to Song of the South for having the same racial inner problems. Hattie would usually find very little variation upon her acting career, usually playing a servant or a maiden. But as Hattie would go on to say, she would rather be paid $700 for playing a maiden in a big feature film rather than working as a real maiden for $7. For Hattie, there was just simply no other job that really paid like being in the movies. And Hattie knew that she had to be well integrated within the Hollywood system. I was whining and crying all the time because I hated the way I had to act. Mammy said to me, you will never come back to Hollywood again because you complain too much. For the main character of the animated segments, Br'er Rabbit was played by John Donson Lee Jr. Probably his best known work outside of Song of the South, was his frequent appearance in the Amos and Andy show, reigning from the 50s and was also one of the earliest television programs to heavily feature black actors. The slow, dim-witted but charming Br'er Bear was played by Nick Stewart. He was anti-Uncle Tom or any other black stereotype, and also heavily against the minstrel shows. Although his acting roles, he walked a very thin line from characters that could be classed as black stereotypes. Nick Stewart really loved the character of Br'er Bear, Walt Disney's Song of the South. And in the center is Uncle Remus, James Basquet. And behind Uncle Remus, you see him peeping around? I did the voice of Burr Bear. Duh, I'm just in the mouth. Yo, hey, clean. Oh, that's me. 
In fact, he reprised the role as Br'er Bear in the 1989 theme park ride inspired from the movie Splash Mountain. During the same year as the opening of the theme park ride, Jim Corcus, Disney historian and also fanboy, asked Nick Stewart towards how did he feel about being in the film, that did he find the role slightly demeaning. And he just gave the biggest laugh I'd ever heard in my entire life. And he says, are you kidding? Disney treated us like kings. He took that money and in Los Angeles, he created the Ebony Theater Workshop in order to give black actors roles other than maids and butlers. Nick Stewart spent his entire career keeping the Ebony's Theatre open. Unfortunately, the building was demolished in 1998 beyond Nick Stewart's control, but in 2007 in Los Angeles, a theatre was reopened in its name, with a similar goal of appreciating African American culture. Sadly, Nick Stewart wouldn't be around to see it, as he passed away in the year 2000, living to the grand old age of 90. Before its release, the title was revised, changing the name from Uncle Remus to Song of the South, premiering on November 12th at Atlanta, Georgia, with the majority of the white cast were there, but the black cast were unable to attend, because Georgian law would not permit them into the movie theatre, Mr. Disney left the premiere once the movie was screening, while he was happy during the interval presenting, but he feared that an unexpected audience reaction would upset him, so he retreated across the street to his hotel room for the night. The film garnered a mixed critical response, with some that either loved it or sickly disliked it. Walter Francis White, the executive secretary, for the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People came onto the scene to write a statement on the feature. This is what he had to say, and I quote, <clears throat> In an effort neither to offend audiences within the North or South, the production helps to perpetuate a dangerously glorified picture of slavery, making use of the beautiful Uncle Remus folklore. Song of the South unfortunately gives an impression of an idyllic master-slave relationship, which is a distortion from the facts although it's worth noting that he actually never saw the movie, only getting a memo from two other members that saw the movie, which made him a bit perplexed to how to write a statement for the film. Eventually, the film would garner a backlash, with groups outside of the movie theatre protesting upon its playing, with some of the cast and crew, such as James Baskett, defending his role as Uncle Remus, with Walt Disney staying absent from the debate being deeply upset as to why the film was gaining so much backlash. He felt that he placed these stories on a new platform for people to appreciate. But regardless on its reviews, it still did moderately alright at the box office, allowing Disney to finally perceive onwards with his other projects. Regardless of its backlash, Song of the South was treated on the same value as any other Disney property, as the cartoon characters appeared in commercials, along with the cartoon segments being shown in various formats upon television. In 1956, Walt Disney created a special hour-long program as a tribute to John Chandler Harris and gave the people outside the South their first knowledge of these beloved animal legends told on the plantations by the old Negro storytellers. As a special way to promote the re-release of Song of the South that same year, but the tribute to John Chandler Harris ceased re-airing during 1960, along with any re-releases of Song of the South during the duration of the 1960s. This may have been in light of the big political movement of that decade concerning the equal treatment between whites and blacks. But 100 years later, the Negro still is not free. 100 years later, the, the life of the Negro is still sadly crippled by the manacles of segregation and the chains of discrimination. After years and years of protest, and backwards and forwards upon negotiations, the Civil Rights Act of 1964 finally put an end to the segregation for people of different skin colour, where black people would finally have the same opportunities as white folks, no longer being segregated, meaning they were no longer classed as second-class citizens. During Christmas of that year, Walt Disney released Mary Poppins, a film that was stuck within 20 years of negotiations, as Disney had to negotiate with Travers, who was the original book author of Mary Poppins. Upon how Disney-fied Travers wanted her story to be, Disney had to meet halfway with Travers upon some certain aspects. But the film is largely Walt's own design, 
as in the original contract for both parties, Walt would get the final say. Along with Song of the South, this was one of the very few times that Walt Disney in his career had to challenge his own vision. But Mary Poppins would be his final major production, as Walt Disney would pass away two years later. Mary Poppins represent as to how much Walt was willing to sacrifice, from his own branding and image that he built up for decades. That exact vision, that he couldn't separate from Song of the South, that he refused to make complicated. Now the Disney Corporation, without its fearless leader, and in this new segregated world, could they still harness and maintain that Disney image moving forward? And could such a film as Song of the South still be appreciated? The Disney Corporation had an exclusive tradition, where every decade the films would be exclusively re-released back into theatres, upon their anniversary of release. This was at the time the only way to re-watch a Disney animated feature, with the exception of several edited down for TV. Song of the South was exempt from being reissued back in the 1960s, and for a short period of time it had been considered to permanently retire the feature, but through popular demand, it had been decided to give Song of the South another go, in 1972, marking it as 16 years since the film was last publicly available, with the conversation of the civil rights movement largely subsiding by this point, making the corporation feeling much more comfortable to unveil the feature. The film reissue was a success, making $7 million, making it the most successful Disney re-release up until that point. It had made more money than its last two releases, which together brought in about $5.4 million, and the critical response was far more positive than its original 1946 release. It appeared time was far more kinder to Song of the South. Despite the annual decade re-release, it was actually re-released the following year, as a double feature alongside Aristocats, as part of the 50th anniversary of Walt Disney Productions then being re-released in 1980 in time for the 100th anniversary of the original publications of the Uncle Remus tales, with the reissues doing far more better in box office numbers, being far more successful than the surrounding Disney features of that era, trying so desperately to break out of that Disney mould. Proceeding into the 80s, where the new Disney films were dwindling in popularity and the company's priority, with Disney during this time becoming far more well known for its other assets, such as the Disneyland parks, where its most luxurious film of the past decade was getting its own theme park ride. To spice the water for the public's interest, and just in time for its 40th anniversary, for the fourth time in 13 years, Song of the South was reissued yet again. But the reviews of this time round, while the animated segments were still a praise, the live action portions on the other hand, were becoming very reminiscent of the critiques back from the 40s. It had been 22 years since of the civil rights movement, giving enough time for a generation of ethnic groups to create media productions that voice the concern of racial inequality, with projects such as the TV series Roots painted a picture of what the Deep South was truly like. The seemingly stereotyped images in the film could no longer be pardoned by the general public. The ride still went on ahead for construction, and while it was always intended for the ride to be mostly based on the animated portions, there were no references made of the live-action segments in the final ride. Splash Mountain was so popular it reappeared in several of the Disneyland theme parks, but little did anybody know at that point that the 1986 re-release of Song of the South would be marked as the final time the movie would ever be officially available in its own home native country. In the late 80s and the duration of the 90s, Disney would release the majority of their back catalogue to home media, finally breaking the annual tradition of only showing their films specifically to the movie theatres, occurring by decade for special occasions, with the notable exception of Song of the South, at least being pardoned in the US, as it was sold on home media and even appeared on television in certain areas of the world with the formats mainly consisting of VHS and Betamax, notably being released on Laserdisc in Hong Kong and Japan in 1990, with countries such as Italy and the Netherlands residing as the final places that the film was officially released on home media, that being VHS, in 1997. In 2006, the BBC broadcast Song of the South on UK television, though
thus marking it as the final time the film was officially shown anywhere. The following year, the CEO of Disney, Bob Iger, who had only been enrolled for the job for over a year, expressed an interest to release Song of the South. But in 2010, he said that there are no current plans to release the film, calling the film antiquated and fairly offensive. And usually the question is always popped up at every Disney sharehold meeting, usually responding feeling that the timing isn't quite right. Disney's creative director, Dave Botix, in a 2010 interview, gave a spark of optimism for the Disney fans, recognising the film's importance to the company's history, not knowing when, but did guarantee that one day they will do something about Song of the South. In 1999, Disney fan Chris Willis launched a fan-made Song of the South website, originally dedicated to his memorabilia, but it eventually grew into an information platform mainly coming from the lack of information that was widely available about the movie, initially starting his website as a defender for the feature and a campaign to get the movie release, but gradually mellowing out over time. While still wanting to see the movie get its DVD release, he's revised a lot of his articles to be non-biased and more respectable towards different opinions, with a news article about any recent information and having a whole page correcting Wikipedia rumours. His website is perhaps the most comprehensible source of information about Song of the South. Floyd Norman was the first black Disney animator working at the studio during Walt Disney's lifetime, working on such classics such as Sleeping Beauty and The Jungle Book, then moving on to television and working on a number of Hanna-Barbera cartoons. He co-financed his company, Vignette Films, creating topics centering around African-American culture. He's had a long, meticulous career working on a number of animated projects, but despite being one of the earliest black animators, Mr. Norman has never gave a second thought towards this significant fact. Always been these horrible rumors around that, that he was not uh, friendly, particularly to people of color, didn't like black people, blah, 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 and you hold it up against the man you know. What do you, what, what do you want people to know? Well, these rumors simply will not go away. Right. But that was not the Walt Disney I knew. I don't know. In 2016, he was made a Disney legend. While he no longer works for the company, his title of a legend makes him a senior to be listened to and has been a supporter of getting the film republicized once again. He's even revealed that book publishers have tried to use his influence to try and license off some of the rare animals from the Disney classic. In 2017, Whoopi Goldberg was made a Disney legend, and after the ceremony, she expressed an interest of trying to start a conversation to re-show Song of the South, suggesting that if it is indeed released on DVD, that it would be most appropriate to include some bonus features to educate the surrounding controversy about the movie. For example, you could very easily have a documentary, The Making of the film, Song of the South, use entertainment to really educate and show a little bit of American history. As it's been seen with companies releasing movies and TV shows from yesteryears with questionable depictions, usually accompanied by a featurette explaining the offending content. Even Disney themselves have practiced this. But as of yet, their internal talks are still in vain. The Disney Corporation is going to find out very soon if they do release this film that African Americans will be outside protesting, that bringing back up that painful reminder is a slap in the face to our ancestors. On the 25th of May of 2020, an African American by the name of George Floyd was arrested after suspicion of carrying a fake $20 note. But while he was being obtained, George broke down into a panic attack, pleading to the officers to not get into the police vehicle as he was claustrophobic. The situation got progressively worse, where George was pinned down, where Officer Derek Chauvin was pressing his knee on George's neck. George repeatedly said over 20 times to the officer that he couldn't breathe, until he finally passed out. An ambulance arrived on the scene, but by then it was far too late. George Floyd had died. Derek Chauvin was later arrested for second degree murder, along with the other officers at the scene. This image of a black man dying at the hands of a white officer 
hit too close to home for many coloured people. This started a movement that there was still a lack of equality in our society, re-sparking the embellishment of the Black Lives Matter movement, initially starting in the US, but it has now transcended across the globe. During this time, media companies have been retracting some of their content that may be seen as racially insensitive and also have heavily re-evaluated their current productions that can feature coloured minorities. The Black Lives Matter movement has even caused an echo through the Disney parks, where after 34 years they've decided to retire the Splash Mountain ride and to re-theme it as a Princess and the Frog attraction, another Disney film that portrays African Americans in a more positive light for the general public. Even references towards the film, such as the instrumentals of Zippity Doodah, have been removed from the park, which in consequence has made Song of the South even more outside of the Disney circle. The future for the film is currently bleak. The definition of racism is by discriminating or hating against a group of people upon their skin colour, culture and nationality. Confuse individuals trying to seek out any aspect that could be interpreted as being racist, say that they don't see anything that's immediately problematic, as the plantation workers and Uncle Remus especially is seen in a well-being manner, teaching Johnny high moral messages, and are never seen explicitly hated against, but it's its antiquarian stereotyping that holds its damaging nature. While Song of the South did not invent the imagery of a white master and black servant relationship, and nor was it alone depicting this kind of relation, but in movies between blacks and whites for its time, using Song of the South as a prime example, we see the black individuals have their life completely evolve around the white family. A young youth of African American could watch the film and wonder why the white family are privileged to have so much luxury around them compared to the black people where the place that they reside to and the clothes they wear are in disrepair. For decades, this type of imagery in media has for multiple generations made non-whites feel as if they don't want to be seen. Alex, your son, gonna feel when he looks up and it's a Caucasian boy up there. And I was like, I don't know, that's how, don't people want to see that? I mean, I don't know if anyone wants to see a Filipino American. Granted, maybe not every single individual, but the impact for a lack of equal opportunity seen in movies and shows can't be ignored. Yeah, because I grew up wanting to have blue eyes yeah. and blonde hair, and I wanted my name to be Mary, mm. you know, because again, we were so subjected to those images and those images alone. I changed my name a few times too. I remember putting clothespins on my nose to make my nose narrower wow. because I was ashamed yeah. of what I looked like. It didn't fit in and it right. didn't belong on, on camera. And while the industry have taken great steps to break the mold of diversity, it still has been a controversial ideal. I know for Susie, one of the most important things was that she sound smart and that she's very well spoken because there were not a lot of brown girls in cartoons. As a matter of fact, there still aren't. I love when people of color come up to me and say, you don't know what it meant to me to see myself in a cartoon. I got one little black girl that I get to see that looks like me. Thank you so much. In an idealized world, it'd be great to think that since the early days of cinema, that society has taken great strides of everybody having an equal opportunity. But the sad truth is that there's still so many out there that feel treated unfairly in the world. Cutting out one blackface joke in an episode and the episode remains intact, you can walk away from. You can't walk away from a death from a bullet. It's easy to say that these people are oversensitive, but it is important to recognize that people are entitled to how they personally feel and shrugging off the situation doesn't precisely help the people in question. And I was, I was like, okay, okay, I'm gonna do this. Did Walt Disney intentionally created a racist movie? Not likely. He so highly rated his black workers on the same level as his white workers. Despite the rather loose attempt to meet in the consultants halfway, was he neglectful on the historical facts of the movie? Likely, but he was also neglectful on the German setting of Snow White. Very little of Italian culture is shown through Pinocchio. The genesis of where these stories came from 
garnered little interest from Walt Disney. Just as these fairy tales have been changed and manipulated for over generations, Walt Disney saw fit to do the same. While he didn't write the script, he could have ceased the arguments that were constantly being fired up by Donald Raymond. But regardless of the facts, is it justifiable for Song of the South to be locked up? Well, that's up for the individual.